Hi, it's Katrina. The flying head. Also called the big head or the great head, the flying head is a cannibalistic, ravenous spirit of Wyandotte and Iroquois mythology who is cursed with an insatiable hunger. Its appearance varies between storytellers, but the flying head is generally depicted as an undead monster that is huge. When it rested on the ground, it was larger than the tallest man, with evil fiery eyes and long, dark and tangled hair and jagged, razor-sharp fangs. Sometimes it has bat or bird wings protruding from its cheeks and bird-like talons. It has no body and flies through the air looking for humans to chase and devour. Most weapons are useless against the flying head's practically impenetrable surface. According to one legend, this evil spirit drove the original native inhabitants away from their hunting grounds on a hill near Lake Sacandaga in what is now upstate New York. The flying head kept other neighboring tribes away for many years to come. One day, a man spotted the flying head flying above the trees looking for human flesh. He ran home, warning the others to leave at once. Everybody left except for a mother who had to stay behind with her child. She built up a great fire and suddenly the flying head appeared. She <laughs> pretended not to notice the beast and started to pretend to eat the flaming hot coals with a forked stick. Mmm, so delicious! The monster got hungrier and hungrier and finally swallowed all the burning rocks with one bite. It howled in pain and flew off into the dark. Nobody knows what tribe first began telling this legend or how it came to be, but the hill that once belonged to the forgotten tribe is believed to be sacred and cursed. The tribe stayed away from it, but three different hotels were built on the site and mysteriously burned down shortly after being constructed. Ukumar. The Ukumar also goes by the names Uku and Ukumar Zupai and is a hairy, bigfoot-like beast that terrorizes people in parts of Chile and Argentina. It's similar to the North American Sasquatch and the Yeti of the Himalayas. Some depictions of the Ukumar liken the creature to a half-bear humanoid. It stands between 5 and 7 feet tall and is covered in thick fur with huge limbs, small eyes and large, sharp teeth. The Uku is like a wild, ugly man with big hands and feet and a long beard. According to writer and historian Carlos Jesus Maita, the Ukumar started life out as an unwanted infant who was abandoned in the mountains. It grew up with the help of Lucifer and became the hairy beast it's known as today. Sometimes it returns to its birth father's farm and steals animals, which it eats raw. The Ukumar attacks and kills mercilessly by ambushing its chosen victims late at night. It loves to kidnap women and children and force them to be his family. Residents of Tolor Grande, Argentina reported hearing eerie, frightening calls at night from the nearby Curu Curu Mountains. A geologist found human-like footprints on the Argentina side of the Andes Mountains at a height of over 16,000 feet. They were about 17 inches long. A year later, similar tracks were found. In 1958, roughly 50 miles outside of Santiago, a group of campers spotted what they described as an ape man. Police were called out to investigate, but all they could do was take reports from the witnesses. In 2010, two ranchers went out to round up their cows late in the evening when they heard a loud sound at the edge of their property. The ranchers pointed their flashlights and saw two enormous green eyes belonging to a humanoid creature with giant fangs. They thought it was a goblin and shot it, hitting it in the head. When they investigated the corpse, they thought they had killed a legendary Ukumar that had been raiding their chickens. It might have just been a rogue ape. It's hard to say. Some people believe the real Ukumar is the spectacled bear, which is the only South American bear species around. The bear is incapable of making the same sound that the Ukumar is known to make, leaving one to wonder if perhaps the humanoid beast's existence simply hasn't been proven yet. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Akamanto The Akamanto is a red-cloaked spirit of Japanese urban legend that haunts bathrooms throughout the country, especially in schools. It tends to have a favorite stall and toilet in each bathroom, often the fourth one, and favors older and seldom used facilities. It's already scary enough using the bathroom at school, let alone worrying about the Akamanto. According to most stories, it started at a school in Tokyo that had a haunted bathroom by the gymnasium. Everyone knew about it and avoided it, but one night a student suddenly needed to use the toilet while at school late in the evening, and the nearest bathroom is the one haunted by Akamanto. It's often in a remote part of the school and is less maintained than the other bathrooms, remember, like I told you. 
But as we all know, sometimes when you gotta go, you gotta go. And the student rushes into the creepy restroom. The already terrified student notices there's no toilet paper when suddenly they hear a voice. The Akamanto always asks a question. Would you like red paper or blue paper? Sometimes the question is not related to the paper at all. The Akamanto is a masked spirit that wears a cloak and will ask, would you like a red cloak or a blue cloak? Whatever you say, it's too late. You are in a lose-lose situation. If you choose red, the Akamanto will stab and slice at their victim, drenching them in blood and making them look as if they're wearing a red cloak. Or their flesh can be ripped off their back. So, a year later, another unlucky student finds themselves urgently needing to use the restroom and there is no option but to use the haunted one. Remembering the last victim, who answered red, the student answers blue. The Akamanto sucks all of their victim's blood or strangles them, leaving them blue and lifeless. Sometimes the evil spirit drags the student into the netherworld for the rest of eternity. So, how do you get out of this? Apparently, you can try to confuse the ghost by answering with another color, or you can try to turn the question around. Akamanto, do you want white paper or red paper? Then he'll leave. Or you can say, I don't need paper, or I don't want a cloak, and hopefully he will let you live. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and let me know your favorite scary creature in the comments below. The Wendigo. The Wendigo is an evil, man-eating monster or spirit of Algonquin folklore stemming primarily from the tribes based in Canada's east coast and the Great Lakes regions and the northern forests of Nova Scotia. Known as the flesh eater of the forest, its physical appearance varies among tribes, but the Wendigo is often described as having some human-like characteristics, but it is emaciated with its bones pushing against its skin. It is said to look like a skeleton risen from the grave with a strange odor of decay and decomposition, the smell of death. The Wendigo may be a former human who was possessed by an evil spirit and became the monster that it is. The creature is associated with insatiable greed, as well as gruesome acts like murder and cannibalism. They can stalk their victims for long periods of time and will bait their prey, making strange shrieks or pretending to be a human calling for help. The Wendigo is never satisfied, no matter how much it eats, and is rather gluttonous despite being shockingly thin. Whenever it devours a person, its body simply grows to accommodate the intake of more victims. According to legend, a Wendigo is created whenever a human resorts to cannibalism to survive. In the frigid north with bitter snow and icy woods, Native Americans and settlers would sometimes find themselves stranded and the fear of becoming a Wendigo helped encourage cooperation. Inside of the Wendigo is the human it once was, frozen where its heart should be. Very few have been rescued from inside, as usually the only escape from this torment is death. To kill a Wendigo, you must use a pure silver blade or bullets and strike it right where its heart should be. Then you must shatter its heart, or the former person it was, into many pieces, put them in a box, and bury it. In one version of the story, the first Wendigo was a warrior who made a deal with the devil. In exchange for the safety of his tribe, he gave him his soul and was transformed into a Wendigo. When peace came to the land, the warrior beast was banished and forced to live as an outcast, becoming even more wild and extreme. The Wendigo inspired the term for a controversial psychological condition known as Wendigo psychosis, which is characterized by a person's fear of becoming a cannibal and or an intense craving for human flesh. Some indigenous communities also consider environmental destruction as a symptom of Wendigo psychosis. Throughout the 1800s and 1900s, several traders and even shaman fell sick with this disease and began to crave human flesh, killing their family members and eating them when food and emergency supplies were readily available. The only explanation, they had been taken over by the Wendigo. Gasha Dokuro In Japanese mythology, Gasha Dokuro are from the category of supernatural spirits and monsters called yokai. They take the form of giant skeletons and are 15 times larger than the average person. They are invincible and indestructible and are rumored to be created from the bones of multiple people who died in battle or from starvation and were never buried. On a deeper level, the Gasha Dokuro represent the many people throughout history who were deprived of their proper funerary rites, whose souls are unable to move on and are reborn as hungry ghosts. 
These supernatural monsters wander the countryside at night, sneaking up on lone travelers before biting their heads off and drinking their blood. Their teeth chatter and their bones rattle as they move along, making a gachi gachi sound. Quick-thinking targets can avoid becoming a Gasha Dokuro's next victim by heeding a sudden loud ringing in their ears. They can also ward the evil spirit off by wearing a Shinto charm. The Gasha Dokuro are too large and powerful to be killed. They only perish after they've exhausted their vast amounts of built-up energy and anger. They're also less common now than they once were, since warfare and famine are not prevalent problems in modern-day Japan. Toyol A Toyol, or Tuyul, is an undead child in Southeast Asian folklore, appearing in stories from Indonesia, Brunei, Malaysia, Thailand, and Singapore. It goes by several different names, which vary from one community to another, and is similar to the Tianak of Philippine mythology. Its appearance is often described as a gray or green toddler-like goblin with cloudy eyes and pointed ears. People invoke toyols using black magic and keep them as helpers for mischievous reasons, like stealing from neighbors. In Javanese mythology, toyols are kept for financial gain, more specifically in a get-rich-quick sort of way. Certain rituals can make them extra powerful and capable of committing more serious crimes, such as murder. Owners keep their toyol in a small jar or urn that is stored in a dark place until its services are needed. In exchange for the toyol's help, they must perform special rituals or make offerings to the creature, and a female household member must allow it to feed on her blood. Relatives of a newlywed bride or groom who own a toyol are encouraged to have the creature visit the couple before dawn. While there, it will suck blood from the bride's toe until she awakens. This greatly enhances the Toyol's strength and speed, thus making it more effective at stealing and helping its owner become rich faster. The frequent disappearance of jewelry, money, or other valuables from someone's home is a sign that a Toyol may be lurking nearby, especially if there are small finger and footprints at or near the crime scene. On the other hand, someone who suddenly exhibits conspicuous displays of wealth may be keeping a toyol. It's unclear what happens to a toyol after it finishes its period of service for a family. One possibility is that the urn containing the toyol is given a proper burial, or perhaps it is passed down through generations. Owners have the option of releasing their toyol to roam free, in which case it visits other people's homes without harming them, or wanders off into the jungle. Adzi. The Adzi is a shape-shifting vampire from the folklore of the Ewe tribe, who live throughout Togo and Ghana. It's a firefly in the wild, but transforms into a human when someone catches it. As a firefly, an Adzi squeezes through closed doors and keyholes at night and sucks people's blood as they sleep, causing their victims to fall ill and die. They prefer younger victims, including children and babies. In human form, Adzis have the power to possess people and turn their victims into witches, which are called abasom. The host, or possessed individual, negatively influences the people who live around them. A victim's family and anyone the person is jealous of are the most likely to feel the Adzis' effects. There are certain situations and signs which increase the likelihood that an Adzi has possessed or will possess someone. Women with brothers are considered especially at risk, especially if the brother's children are doing better than her own. When young people suddenly start dying, but the elderly live, it may mean that an adzi has taken control of an old person. Poor people who envy the rich are also among the adzi's primary targets. There is no known way of defeating an adzi in firefly form. When one is caught, it transforms into its more vulnerable human state. Only then can an adzi be defeated or killed. The Adzi most likely gained a foothold in Ewe folklore as a way to explain the spread of deadly mosquito-borne diseases like malaria. Amit Also known as Amut, Amit was an ancient Egyptian goddess and demoness who held various titles, including devourer of the dead and eater of hearts. Her body was made of parts from the three largest man-eating animals known to the ancient Egyptians. She had the head of a crocodile, the torso of a lion, and the hindquarters of a hippopotamus, but also appeared in the form of a human at times. Amit was a funerary deity and the personification of divine retribution. She lived in the Egyptian underworld where her job was to judge the souls of the deceased by listening to their confessions and then weigh their heart against an ostrich feather belonging to Maat, the goddess of truth. A person did not need to be completely wholesome or anywhere near perfect to pass this test. They simply had to be reasonably balanced to essentially prove that the good in them outweighed any of the bad that they had committed throughout their life. 
The deceased could also use special amulets and spells to increase their chances of moving past this stage of judgment. When someone's heart proved to be impure, Amit either devoured it or threw it into a nearby lake of fire, depending on the story. The person's path toward immortality stopped there, and their soul became eternally restless, a process the ancient Egyptians regarded as a type of second death. Amit lived according to the scales of justice and gave the deceased one last chance to defend their actions and avoid damnation. People did not worship her, they feared her because she represented destruction and all the things the ancient Egyptians feared, including the consequences of not living by the principles of Mat. Kalupalik the Kalupalik is a female humanoid demon of Inuit mythology who dwells in the icy arctic waters of what is now northern Alaska and Canada. While mermaids sound nice in theory, this creature is quite different. It's incredibly hideous with bumpy green skin, webbed claws, fins coming out of its head, back and torso, and long hair and nails. They are said to smell like sulfur and carry an amauti. This is a type of parka with a pouch below the hood that Inuit women often use to carry their babies. Why does it have this? Because it loves to kidnap small Inuit children that get too close to the icy water. Inuit parents use stories about the Kalupalik victimizing children as cautionary tales to prevent their kids from going too close to the water's edge. The creature entices children to the shore and to dangerous parts of the ice with a humming sound and sometimes by tapping on the ice above the water. When a child gets close enough, the Kalupalik leaps from the water and snatches them away using its sharp fingernails and then jams them into the Amauti. Its face is only seen for a brief instant during the kidnapping before it drags its victim beneath the water. In some stories, the monster devours children. In others, it casts a sleeping spell on its victims and transports them to a cave. Either way, the victim is never seen or heard from again, and the Kalupalik feeds off their energy to maintain its immortality. The Mothman One of the most horrifying things ever discovered near Chernobyl had nothing to do with the actual meltdown of the nuclear reactor. Instead, what Chernobyl staff saw just before the deadly explosion that became one of the worst nuclear disasters in the history of humanity was a monster. Not just any monster, either. Before the explosion rocked Ukraine, witnesses saw a creature flying through the sky described as being some kind of freak of nature. The beast had glowing red eyes, it seemed to be completely black, and it had wings so large there is no way it could have been an eagle or a giant bat. It's become known as the Blackbird of Chernobyl, though many people claim it was really the infamous Mothman from West Virginia legend. You're probably wondering how on earth the legendary Mothman could have showed up to a small Ukrainian village hosting a nuclear reactor all the way from Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Well, if you know anything about the Mothman legends, you'll know that the Mothman is always a warning of impending doom. Whenever the Mothman is seen, a catastrophic event almost always comes immediately after, just like the collapse of the Silver Bridge in December of 1967 that killed 46 people, shortly after the Mothman was seen flying around. Unfortunately, the only proof that what workers saw was real is a blurry photograph of what appears to be a black creature with spindly legs and long, almost angel-like wings flying overhead in the dark. Since the Chernobyl incident, the Mothman has yet to be seen again. Mutant Wolves In a shocking new study of wolves around Chernobyl, specifically in the radiated exclusion zone, researchers have discovered that the animals could be spreading mutations caused by radiation to other populations of European wolves. According to the report from National Geographic, researchers tracked and studied 13 wolves using specialized collars for measuring radiation. They found a few expected results. First, the wolves experienced a burst of radiation when traveling through contaminated areas. However, they found that one of the young male wolves trekked for 250 miles through Belarus and into Russia, likely in search of a mate after being contaminated. Here's where the danger comes in. Michael Byrne from the University of Missouri, who studies animal movements, says that because the wolf population in the exclusion zone is so high, it makes sense that young animals will disperse. But if the wolves mutate and they breed with wolves from outside of the exclusion zone, they could transfer unhealthy mutations to the next generation of wolves. Not only that, but they also have the ability to contaminate uncontaminated areas with their radiation. 
It's hard to really understand what all of this means. Nobody knows exactly to what extent these radioactive mutations will reach. We know that radiation in wolves can cause tumors, extra small brains, and developmental abnormalities. If gone unchecked, some are wondering if the mutations could spread and ultimately wipe out all the European wolves, or maybe even turn them into eerie mutants running through the forest. The Radioactive Elephant Deep in the heart of Chernobyl is a radioactive elephant. More specifically, it's a radioactive elephant's foot. Elephant's foot is the nickname given to a huge chunk of radioactive material beneath the nuclear power plant at Chernobyl. It was discovered in December of 1986 in the remains of reactor number four after it exploded. Out of everything in the plant and the surrounding area, the elephant's foot is to this day still the most radioactive thing around. The elephant's foot is also special because its radioactivity has not decreased that much since the original disaster. But what is this thing made out of? It's comprised primarily of silicon dioxide, though the clump is also packed with traces of uranium, magnesium, and graphite. All of these things combined create some serious radioactivity. The mass was solid after the explosion and couldn't even be damaged by a remotely operated drill. It didn't start to crack until 1998, and in 2021, the mass had melted to become almost like sand. Now here's how lethal the elephant's foot is. Eight months after it was formed, the radioactivity while standing close to the mass was 8,000 röntgens. What this means is that you were given a fatal dose of radiation in just five minutes. And even though it's gotten less dangerous over the years, it is still able to kill a person if they linger too close for too long. Giant Catfish Besides wolves, there are giant catfish prowling the cooling pond near the Chernobyl power plant. The cooling pond was used to keep the reactors from overheating. Today, there isn't much use for the cooling pool since the power plant's not really functioning anymore. However, the cooling plant is filled with fish of enormous proportions. Some of these fish are monsters, much larger than average. But what you might not believe is that radiation has nothing to do with the preposterous size of these huge catfish. What a lot of people don't realize is that radiation doesn't usually mutate things to become giant versions of themselves. At least that's what University of South Carolina radiation specialist Timothy Moso says. He says that instead of growing to be gigantic, animals that are mutated instead become less efficient. This means they have a harder time catching food, getting from place to place, and breeding. This lack of efficiency almost always leads to the animal dying because it can no longer compete in a world of predators and prey. Mutations aren't nearly as glamorous as you see in video games and movies, and animals don't really get any cool superpowers. The truth is significantly more disturbing and uglier. The catfish living in the Chernobyl cooling pond are natural giants. These are Wells catfish and can already grow to giant proportions, with some of the biggest Wells catfish growing to be over 350 pounds. There isn't anything radioactive about them. The question is, how did they get there in the first place? And how did they survive? A hovering UFO. After the Chernobyl disaster on April 26, 1986, tons of radioactive byproduct went flying into the atmosphere. It was a calamity, but apparently some in the area witnessed what they described as an unidentified flying object, perhaps an alien ship, flying over the plant shortly after the explosion. Some believe that the UFO may have caused the nuclear reactor to explode on purpose as part of some kind of cosmic experiment being performed on humans. There is no way to possibly verify this. However, there have been unsubstantiated claims that people who were radiated at Chernobyl are giving birth to children who have a strange yellow fluid inside of their body instead of blood. They say that within just a handful of generations, the offspring of these yellow-blooded mutants will be smarter than Einstein. This, of course, is an urban legend. Unfortunately, seeing as Chernobyl exploded in 1986, nobody really had a smartphone handy to snap pictures of the alleged UFO in the sky. Since then, all talk of aliens being involved with the worst nuclear disaster in history have all but been wiped under the rug. Anyone who believes that people really did see UFOs outside Chernobyl has been deemed a crackpot and a conspiracy theorist. But the truth is that there have been enough witnesses to grant at least the possibility of something strange being in the sky that day, whether alien, government, or maybe something else. Radioactive Hotspots 
The Red Forest of Chernobyl is one of the most radioactive places on the planet. Recently, researchers from the United Kingdom working with the University of Bristol traveled to the exclusion zone and then used special drones to go deep into the most radiated parts of the forest to measure gamma radiation and neutrons. These drones are known as Unmanned Aerial Vehicles, or UAV for short. It was an attempt to map the Red Forest and see just how truly radiated it still is all these years later. What they found were additional radioactive hotspots previously unknown to Ukrainian authorities, according to the University of Bristol. The Red Forest covers an area of about four square miles. The forest originally earned its name when the radiation turned the trees a terrifying reddish-brown color. Instead of being green and vivid, the vegetation here is red and not thriving very well. The drone began eight miles from the epicenter of the explosion in a small village located at the edge of the exclusion zone. They then moved the drone inward, searching through the forest during a 10-day survey with a total of 24 hours in the air. The deeper into the forest, the more radiation they detected. The university will now share the information about the hot zones they discovered with local authorities to help keep people out of the woods and from turning into mutants. Mysterious Otter one of the strangest things recently spotted in the forests of Chernobyl was an unlikely animal. This was not a monster or a mutant freak. Instead, it was a regular otter. The otter was discovered wandering through the radiated exclusion zone. Researchers trying to track wildlife through the area around Chernobyl to see how it's been recovering used hidden cameras. They used fish carcasses to bait the animals close to the shore where they had the cameras positioned and managed to capture on video 15 species of bird and mammals in the quarantine region. Everyone was shocked when an otter came out of nowhere and gobbled up one of the dead fish. This was the first time that researchers spotted such an animal inside the exclusion zone since humans left in 1986. Even more shocking is that the cameras also captured images of white-tailed eagles and American mink. It's unclear whether any of these animals are highly mutated or dangerous. It's not clear if there's a family of otters living nearby, but as far as anyone can tell, the animals seem perfectly healthy and not in the least bit affected. 98% of the fish the researchers put out was eaten, which is a high rate of scavenging. The researchers were very excited and take this as a great sign that wildlife is now thriving. Birth Defects The most tragic thing that happened following the Chernobyl nuclear disaster has been a string of birth defects. The men and women who lost their lives trying to contain the nuclear disaster were very courageous and their loss was also tragic. But since 1986, physicians in the region have reported a spike in birth defects that is nothing short of heartbreaking. Many children in southern Belarus and northern Ukraine have been suffering congenital birth defects that leave them crippled and mangled for life. A study done by the American Academy of Pediatrics found a direct correlation between dangerous levels of strontium-90 and birth defects. Strontium-90 is of course a radioactive element produced thanks to nuclear fission. It's no surprise that such a volatile element would cause such harm. And while I'm not going to get into the specifics of the birth defects because it really is quite sad, there was another study done by UNICEF that has suggested at least 20% of adolescent children in the country of Belarus have been born with a serious disability because of a birth defect. As you can imagine, having 20% of children disabled because of a birth defect is a shocking number. It should be closer to the 0% mark, which really makes you wonder just how far the radiation went and for how much longer we will see its after effects. A horrifying new species. There has been a rumor going around that a disturbing new species of monster has been born from the radiation surrounding Chernobyl. Pictures of the monster have been uploaded online. It has black leathery skin, dark and evil eyes, and a face unlike anything you've ever seen before. It seems to be a very real monster that maybe lost all its hair because of all the dangerous radiation. It's more of an urban legend than an actual real creature. The so-called proof was an image of something else, but people are still afraid there is some sort of scary monster species roaming the forest. Other than some rumors and anecdotal reports of creatures, no mutant werewolves or night monsters have been found in the woods outside Chernobyl. The picture that has been going around describing the creature is actually an Andean bear who goes by the name of Dolores. Dolores and a few other bears came from the Andean mountains of South America after being discovered suffering from some kind of strange hairless disorder. 
These bears didn't lose their hair because of radiation. It was something altogether different. Animals rule Chernobyl. The nuclear reactor at Chernobyl exploded over 30 years ago. Since then, people have not been living in the affected area. And while we know that there have certainly been some very terrifying birth defects in animals and humans, something else has come from all the turmoil. With a huge area around Chernobyl and Pripyat becoming uninhabitable for people, animals have moved in at astoundingly high levels. I've already told you about otters and wolves, but National Geographic says there are many more exotic species living in the area, such as brown bear, lynx, beaver, deer, owls, moose, foxes, and plenty of others, making it what scientists are calling a wildlife sanctuary. This is one of the rare times when humans have left some place indefinitely while it was still relatively normal. Sure, there's some radiation, but at the edges of the exclusion zone you would never know. The vegetation looks normal, there are still bugs and critters, and animals are thriving without any human intervention. The exclusion zone straddles the border of Ukraine and Belarus. Studies have shown that large mammals on the Belarusian side of the zone have increased dramatically since the explosion. During a short five-week survey, a team of scientists documented 21 boar, 60 raccoon dogs, 9 badgers, 26 gray wolves, and even a bison. One of the scientists said it was just incredible because you literally can't go anywhere without bumping into a wolf. Unfortunately, there aren't really any other places like the exclusion zone where animals can really be free from human interaction. Nature has risen from the ashes. Bone-Eating Bearded Vulture The bearded vulture, also known as the Lammergeier, is a pretty intense bird. It is a bird of prey and known for its unusual habit of dropping bones or freshly killed corpses on top of rocks to shatter the bones so they can get to the marrow inside. It's a little bit scary looking as it also dyes its feathers blood red with soil that contains iron oxide. Don't worry, it's not blood. But it makes it one of the most feared birds in the animal kingdom. There are people who believe that the bearded vulture has carried away children, however, this has never been proven. But it does have a fearsome reputation. They can be found in Europe, Asia, and Africa, and have a wingspan of about 6 to 9 feet. Its name, Lammergeier, means lamb vulture in German because that is what it was famous for eating. 80% of the bird's diet consists of bones and bone marrow. After finding a picked over carcass, the bird will drop it from a tremendous height in order to bust it open. These birds are very little danger to humans, except for their dropping technique. Not only do these birds pick up carcasses, but they also pick up other animals, like large tortoises. If you are around the area when the bird is about to drop its dinner, you could be seriously injured or even killed. It is said that the Greek playwright Aeschylus was killed when a tortoise fell from the sky. Maybe the Lammergeier dropped it. Ribbon-tailed Astrapia There are 42 known species of bird of paradise, but the one that stands out the most is called the ribbon-tailed Astrapia. Native to the central highlands of Papua New Guinea, they can grow to just over 3 feet long and have an olive green and bronze colored plumage. The most notable feature of this bird, of course, is its tail, which is the longest tail in relation to body size of any bird on Earth. In some cases, it can be more than three times the length of their body. Their diet is made up of insects, spiders, and frogs, and they were the most recent of all the bird of paradise species to be discovered. Their limited range, however, means that they are already considered as a near-threatened species. They are easy to capture, and there is a high demand for their beautiful tails. They are also monogamous, so if a nest is affected by deforestation, breeding pairs that are separated will never match up with any others, making them more endangered by the minute. Andean Cock of the Rock With its bright plumage and the fan-shaped crest of males, it's no surprise that the Andean Cock of the Rock has become the national bird of Peru where it is found. The orange-red coloration covers its head and chest, while they have a black tail and wing feathers. They feed on fruit and small vertebrates, but the most interesting behavioral trait of this species is their mating ritual. The males perform a courtship dance at a display ground, which sees them jump up and down and make a variety of croaking sounds. The one that seemed to be the most athletic, with the best dance and hops, and has the most vivid colors, will win the affection of the female. I mean, who can resist that? The female then lays her eggs in crescent-shaped nests that they build from mud. Because of their unusual appearance, Andean Cock of the Rocks have become popular in the international wildlife trade, but it's unclear how much this and deforestation is affecting the species. 
due to their habitats covering large stretches of jungle, accurate estimates of population numbers are virtually impossible, but its large range means it's currently classed as being okay. The Kakapo The Kakapo is a critically endangered species of nocturnal, flightless parrot that's native to the forests of New Zealand. Also called the owl parrot, these birds were very important to the Maori, inspiring many stories and legends. It's thought that they were widespread across the country until humans arrived with predators such as cats, rats, ferrets, and stoats, and hunted them almost to extinction. Their number fell to as low as just 50 in the 1990s before conservation efforts began. They are quite large, growing to 25 inches in length, and can weigh up to 9 pounds. Their faces are pale and almost look like those of an owl, while their feathers are moss green colored with hints of yellow that allow them to blend into their surroundings. As with other bird species in the country, they evolved without any natural predators and aren't exactly quick to get away from danger. Their wings aren't big enough to allow them to fly and are instead used to help them balance when walking on logs or to help them control their descent if they fall from a branch. It is the world's only flightless parrot, so it's not really good for their survival. Now, there are thought to be only several hundred remaining, all of which live on two predator-free islands, Waneaho and Anchor, and it's hoped that they can be introduced to other areas as they begin to breed more. Shoebill Stork Shoebill storks can be found across the marshes of East Africa in countries like South Sudan and Uganda, where they are seen standing as still as they can in the water and wait for their prey to pass by. They grow to up to 5 feet tall, have a wingspan of more than 8 feet, and their bills look more like a wooden clog shoe than a mouth. Despite their name, they aren't actually a species of stork, and are instead much more closely related to pelicans. They've become known as rather aggressive birds, not just because of the death stare they appear to have when lying in wait for food and with their bill pushed against their body, but also because they have a mean bite. The first zoologists who studied them in the Victorian era wrote of how vicious they could be, and they often refused to get anywhere near them. There are very few places in the world outside of Africa that you can see a shoebill because they are notoriously difficult to breed in captivity. In fact, in the past 100 years, only two chicks have been successfully born that weren't in the wild, and this has led to them being in extremely high demand on the black market. A healthy, live shoebill stork can sell for around $10,000 in Dubai or Saudi Arabia, so efforts to prevent their international trade are ongoing. Vulturine Guinea Fowl This majestic-looking bird is the Vulturine guinea fowl, the largest of any of the guinea fowl species. It can be found in Northeast Africa and Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania, where they feed on seeds and small invertebrates. These birds live together in flocks of around 25 individuals, and although they are able to fly, they prefer to stay on the ground and run away from threats. They live in areas with a great deal of open space, but you'll rarely see one far away from cover or in a tree. And the best way to know if there's one nearby is to listen out for its distinctive call that sounds like it's going chink, chink, chink. They can grow to around 30 inches tall and have an unusually small head in relation to the rest of their body. Their blue heads closely resemble those of a vulture because of the lack of plumage, but their bright blue, white, and black feathers across their bodies make them look more like a jewel on the harsh savanna landscape. They are used to the dry environment and can go for long periods without needing to drink. They make up for this by foraging for fruit, grubs, and vegetation, which provides them with a source of liquid while also giving them the nutrition that they need. Resplendent Quetzal The resplendent Quetzal is often called the rare jewel bird of the world by people native to Central America where the Quetzal is found. Many consider it the most beautiful bird in the world due to the male Quetzal's long twin tail feathers and vibrant coloring. The feathers can grow a train up to three feet long and colors range from green to blue to yellow to ultramarine. They are the national bird of Guatemala and are also the name of the currency, the Quetzal. The bird was sacred to the ancient Maya and Aztec people and it is often closely associated with the god Quetzalcoatl. They viewed the Quetzal as the god of the air and as a symbol of goodness and light. Rulers, priests, and nobility wore headdresses made up of quetzal feathers. However, it was a crime to kill a quetzal bird, so they would capture them, take the feathers, and set them free. The birds build their nests over 200 feet in the air and during mating season make special vocal calls. Females lay two blue eggs in a nest built in a rotten tree. Sadly, since the tree has to be rotten, it often damages the eggs, leading to a high rate of nest failure, about 70% but both parents take turns incubating and taking care of their young. The Quetzalbird is listed as near-threatened due to habitat loss. The Golden Pheasant 
Golden pheasants, which are found in China, are one of the most unusual species of pheasant you will ever see. Despite being native to mountainous regions in the west of the country, they have been exported around the world, and stable populations have now been established across Europe, South America, and Australasia. They grow to around 41 inches long, with a tail that makes up at least two-thirds of that, but it's their coloration that makes them truly stand out. They have a golden crest with red, blue, and black plumage across the body and yellow feet. It's only the males with these colors, however, as they are used by the females to decide which ones are worth making with. The females, on the other hand, have duller brown feathers, which makes them look much more similar to other types of pheasant. It's another species that avoids flying whenever it can and will usually try to run to avoid danger if possible. They spend most of their lives on the ground in search of leaves, seeds, and insects, but at night they'll roost high up in the trees to keep away from danger when they're asleep. Rufus Potu The Rufus Potu is a small species of bird from South America where they live in the leaf debris of the rainforest across Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, and Brazil. They can grow to up to 10 inches long, and it has one of the most effective camouflage adaptations of any bird because they look just like a decaying leaf. When they're roosting in a tree, it's virtually impossible to see them, but you'll always know one is close by from the distinctive call that echoes through the forest canopy, although you'll only ever hear it on nights when there is a full moon. They are usually a dull brown color with white spots and dark speckles, and the tail is a little bit darker than the rest of its body. It's not just the body of the Rufus Potu that's perfectly camouflaged. They do the same with their nest, too. Unusually, they are built on a single vertical branch and lay just one egg, which means it's virtually invisible to any potential predators. The Spectacled Eider Spectacled eiders are an unusual species of large sea duck that can be found in the cold waters of Alaska and northern Siberia. They grow to be around 22 inches long and are identifiable by their black chests, white backs, and very strange facial markings with white spectacle patches around their eyes. They are a diving species and feed mainly on mollusks and crustaceans from the ocean, but move to inland wetland areas during the spring when it's time to breed. Population numbers of this species rapidly declined between the 1970s and the 1990s, and it's not entirely clear why this happened. They are now classified as being threatened, and there are now only three primary nesting areas in the coastal plains of Alaska, Russia, and the yukon kuskokwim Delta. Efforts are underway to prevent illegal harvesting of them and to further understand how the ecosystem is changing and affecting their reproduction, and it's hoped conservation programs will help them to recover. Hoatzin Hoatzins are the national birds of Guyana and are native to the swamps and forests of the Amazon basin where you'll often see them searching for leaves and fruit. They have beautiful orange crests and a baby blue face, but there is one adaptation in this species of bird that has led to the rather unfortunate alternative name of the stink bird. They have an unusually large crop where they hold their food so it can ferment before being swallowed. This is a vital part of their digestive process, but results in them emitting a really bad smell. If that's not enough, they are also very noisy. They constantly groan, croak, hiss, and grunt, and almost appear to dance alongside the sounds. They aren't very good flyers, and due to deforestation, they are considered to be an at-risk species. The Long Waddled Umbrella Bird Native to the Pacific Slope of the Andes between Colombia and southern Ecuador are these strange creatures, the Long Waddled Umbrella Birds. Apart from having an impressive quiff-like crest on their heads, they also have a huge chest waddle. It's so big, in fact, that it gets in the way of them flying, so they've developed the ability to retract it at will. This has also become a crucial part of their mating behavior, too, and groups of males perform leks, which show off their waddles and their ability to retract and extend them in an attempt to prove their worth to the females. They are a highly prized catch for hunters, which, along with threats from habitat destruction and predators in the region, means that they are considered to be a vulnerable species, and one that could become endangered soon if things keep going as they are. Tylosaurus It doesn't get bigger than the Tylosaurus when talking about gigantic prehistoric creatures. Weighing in at 7 tons and stretching to a whopping 45 feet long, the long, sleek predator was one of the largest and most vicious marine reptiles to lurk through the late Cretaceous period. The deadly Tylosaurus had flippers and a vertical flattened tail that it utilized to propel itself through the water. It could ambush its prey with rapid bursts of acceleration. Known as a mosasaur, this ginormous predatory marine lizard had two rows of pointy cone-shaped teeth on each side of its jaw. Using its snout to locate prey, it would then use its powerful head to ram and stun its victim. 
Once it grabbed on, it was over, and Tylosaurus would swallow its prey whole. When it opened its mouth for one final gulp, it would reveal two extra rows of teeth on the roof of its mouth that would work as the final kiss of death and prevent any prey from escaping. Talk about an unceremonious death from one of the deadliest hunters in the ancient seas. Amazingly, paleontologists have found preserved stomach contents showing that the Tylosaurus would eat just about anything, including seabirds, sharks, plesiosaurs, and other mosasaurs. While it is not a dinosaur, it did live alongside them and died out about the same time. Liopleurodon A marine reptile from the Mesozoic era, Liopleurodon's name means smooth-sided teeth. It was discovered from just three teeth found in a town in France in the 19th century. It is a type of marine reptile that is characterized by its elongated head, short neck, and long flippers attached to a thick torso. If the fact that the Liopleurodon was found in France surprises you, it may make more sense when you realize much of present-day Western Europe was underwater during the late Jurassic period, which was 160 to 150 million years ago. The Liopleurodon was a pliosaur and was the apex predator of late Jurassic Europe, and they were very common in those waters, as common as modern-day sharks. Weighing up to 10 tons and measuring about 30 feet long, they were known to dine on other fish, squids, and other smaller marine reptiles, using their flat, broad flippers to thrust themselves through the water while hunting. Scientists believe they may have had a well-developed sense of smell thanks to the forward-facing position of the nostrils on their snout, allowing them to locate distant prey with ease. The only thing to get in their way of being the true king of the ocean? They didn't have gills. Instead, their lungs required them to surface to get air similar to whales, seals, and dolphins. Still, the deadly predator didn't last forever. 150 million years ago, reptiles known as mosasaurs took over the seas, and the mighty Liopleurodons went extinct. Thalatoarchon sarophagus The Thalatoarchon was known not only for their size, but their ferocity. With a name that means lizard-eating sovereign of the sea, the marine reptile lived at the same time as the dinosaurs and are even believed to have lived for 160 million years. With remains uncovered under rocks that dated back 244 million years, the Latoarchon had teeth measuring 5 inches long. Part of the ichthyosaur family, the T. sarophagus evolved from a land-dwelling reptile that moved back into the water sometime during its lifetime. Abundant during the Jurassic period, they had massive skulls. Their large, cutting-edge teeth could easily slice through the bodies of other animals similar to their own size. In fact, their size is comparable to modern orca whales. Found in a remote mountain range in what is now Nevada, scientists discovered the fossils in 1998 and finally recovered them over a three-week dig in 2010. Remarkably, most of the animal was preserved and the remains included the skull, minus the snout, parts of the fins, and the complete vertebral column up to the tip of the tail. Looking over the Favret Canyon region in the arid Augusta Mountains in Nevada, where the fossils were found, it's hard to picture a vast ocean teeming with life. Today, the dry brush and scrub seem like the least likely place to unearth a massive underwater predator, but you never know what's hiding underneath the Earth. And now for number 7. But first, be sure to subscribe to Origins Explained and click the notification bell if you haven't already. Tanistrophius. Sure, the Tanistrophius is yet another marine reptile, but one look at the long, narrow neck of this archosaur and you'll know right away that we're dealing with a very different prehistoric sea creature. Stretching 10 feet, the length of its neck was said to be supported by only about a dozen extremely elongated vertebrae. In fact, it was as long as the rest of its trunk and tail combined. So it also makes sense that its name is Greek for long-necked one. Found near the shores of the European continent, it swam throughout the late Triassic period about 215 million years ago. Stretching up to 20 feet long, the creature also had webbed hind feet, but some paleontologists believe its long neck was a kind of fishing line. Their theory is that the Tanistrophius would sit on the shore or in riverbeds and plunge its head into the water like a fishing line to capture any unlucky prey that happened to swim by. First discovered in the 19th century, a sample in 2006 gave further insight into the creature and its overlapping scales and muscular hindquarters, which paleontologists believe may have given it more movement than they originally thought. Thalassomedon One of the largest of the early plesiosaurs, which were marine reptiles characterized by their long, narrow necks, small heads, and streamlined torsos, the Thalassomedon was uncovered in Colorado in 1939. Originally swimming in the Western Interior Seaway, which was an inland sea that divided North America in two during the Cretaceous period, the massive creature is believed to have dined on fish and squid. 
Its name means sea lord, and although its neck was about half its length, it had 62 vertebrae, way more than the Tanistrophius. Discovered in 1943, it existed almost 100 million years ago, and so far two different specimens have been found by paleontologists in Colorado and Montana. Some thalassomedons were discovered with stones in their stomachs. Other plesiosaurs were also found to have the stones, which suggests that they were used as a way to aid digestion. Maybe it's because these apex predators hunted other marine animals and needed a way to break down their food. Either way, these massive creatures earned the Sea Lord moniker just by existing, and it is thanks to paleontologists who continue to surprise and inform us of their fascinating finds. Chronosaurus Known as one of the largest and deadliest marine reptiles to have ever lived, the Chronosaurus was a fascinating reptile named after the Greek mythological figure Kronos, the father of Zeus. The first fossil of a Chronosaurus was found in northeastern Australia in 1899. Three quarters of a century later, another specimen was found in Colombia, which is well known for other discoveries of prehistoric snakes, crocodiles, and turtles. So far, only two identified species of Chronosaurus have been found. A type of marine reptile known as a pliosaur, Chronosaurus is characterized by having a massive head and short neck with broad flippers and measuring 33 feet from snout to tail. Their close cousins, plesiosaurs, had smaller heads, longer necks, and a more streamlined body. Believed to weigh from 7 to 10 tons, that makes Chronosaurus, a close relative of Liopleurodon, the deadly predator I just told you about, the second heaviest of the plesiosaurs. There is a Chronosaurus skeleton on display at the Harvard Museum of Natural History. The only problem is when paleontologists reassembled the exhibit, they included too many vertebrae, which has led people to believe that Chronosaurus is much bigger than it actually was. You would think that such a large predator would have lethal teeth in its massive jaw, but even though they measured a few inches long, they were not particularly sharp. Researchers now believe they would chase their prey at high speeds and shake them before crushing their skulls. Although there have only been fossils discovered in Australia and Colombia, the fact that the two countries are so far apart leads paleontologists to believe that Chronosaurus could be uncovered on other continents. With the western U.S. being covered in a shallow body of water during the early Cretaceous period, when Chronosaurus was around, it's quite possible that more specimens could turn up in the future. Dunkleosteus with all of this talk of big, fearsome creatures, some argue that the Dunkleosteus could possibly beat them all. Long before the age of the dinosaurs, and even before gigantic sharks roamed the seas, there was the Dunkleosteus. A fish with thick, bony plates that covered their skulls, this creature lived around 360 million years ago and measured up to 6 meters long. It's definitely not the largest of these prehistoric creatures, so what makes them so scary? Maybe it's the armored headgear and their aggressive nature. As full-grown adults, these predators had jaws that were strong enough to not only take down prey, but each other as well. The Dunkleosteus also had no teeth. Instead, the bony plates inside their skulls extended into sharp fangs in the front of their mouths, which scraped together and sharpened against each other every time they opened and closed them. Self-sharpening in nature is kind of rare. Discovered in the Cleveland Shale in Ohio, as the fish grew, their mouths changed. Their jaws started to lengthen and their fangs up front grew stronger, which allowed them to bite with more power, giving them the ability to puncture even heavily armored prey, like other Dunkleosteus. With skull bones from a medium-sized Dunkleosteus measuring almost 3 meters long, paleontologists discovered some fossils had huge gouges across them left by enormous fangs, perhaps inflicted by other Dunkleosteus. With most bites found near the joints and gaps in the armor, and the weakest points toward the back of the skull, researchers believe the bites weren't random, and instead a result of the attacker biting numerous times, until the armor finally cracked. Sure, life in the Devonian seas probably meant every prehistoric sea creature had to fend for themselves. Having these powerful jaws and armor would definitely be a plus to survive as one of the nastiest monster fish in prehistoric oceans. Shastasaurus When new specimens of a 27-foot marine reptile known as Shastasaurus were found in China, paleontologists were pretty excited. Shastasaurus was a type of ichthyosaur, but was different from all the rest. While most of the time ichthyosaurs have a long snout filled with small conical teeth, these actually had a shortened mouth with no teeth. Although paleontologists had already found several species of Shastasaurus in China, British Columbia, and the western U.S., these fossils actually came from a different species of Shastasaurus that had a different skull anatomy than others previously uncovered. But now, 
Researchers believe the previous species were not Shastasaurus at all, and the one found in China with its shorter snout and no teeth was a true Shastasaurus. Similar to modern-day beaked whales, their short skull and toothless jaw meant they rapidly retracted their tongues, creating a small pocket of suction to draw in small prey. Because Shastasaurus has a generally similar skull to these beaked whales, researchers believe the ichthyosaur adapted to become a suction feeder millions of years before whales did. So why did they evolve this way? Levels of oxygen in the atmosphere dropped during the time when Shastasaurus was around. Fish populations died out and the only thing left to eat were cephalopods, like squid. Because suction feeding is an easy way for creatures to consume small, quick prey, such as cephalopods, scientists believe Shastasaurus evolved to take advantage of the boom in squid populations at the time. Regardless of the reason, Shastasaurus evolved and became a suction feeder, making it just one variety of ichthyosaur that swam and fed in the Triassic past. Mauisaurus. Another marine reptile that was discovered in 1874, the Mauisaurus existed in marine environments some 85.8 million years ago. The carnivore, whose name means Maui lizard, was discovered in New Zealand. Scientists continue to speculate about the size of the Mauisaurus due to fossils that were attributed to the species that came from so many different locations. Ranging from 13 to 20 meters long, the Mauisaurus has long, sharp teeth that are usually found in plesiosaurs and are well suited for capturing slippery, fast moving prey. Found in the late Cretaceous period, they were said to weigh from 10 to 15 tons and existed on a diet of fish. Their extremely long necks and slender bodies had 68 separate vertebrae, which took up a main proportion of the creature's body. Its name, though, does not refer to the lush Hawaiian island, but instead a deity of the Maori people of New Zealand. Maui, the Maori god, pulled the islands of New Zealand up from the seafloor with a fish hook, which kind of illustrates just how long and flexible the neck of this enormous creature was. One of the biggest plesiosaurs alive at the end of the Cretaceous period, it was one of the few dinosaur-era fossils ever to be discovered in New Zealand, which landed the Mauisaurus on an official postage stamp in 1993. Not a bad way to leave a lasting impression. Eurypterid. As if scorpions aren't bad enough, imagine living in a time when a human-sized sea scorpion lurked just below the surface of the water. Known as Eurypterids, these creatures were around some 460 million years ago in what is now Iowa. A type of arthropod that is related to modern arachnids and horseshoe crabs, these ancient sea scorpions are the oldest Eurypterid fossils on record by 9 million years. Measuring up to 5.6 feet long, the creatures had special limbs that developed as they aged. With rear limbs shaped like paddles that were used to swim, they also had second and third pairs of limbs that were angled forward and were probably used to grab prey. Add to that the fact that the three back pairs of legs were shorter than the front ones, researchers believe this indicated that they walked on six legs instead of eight. That doesn't make them any less creepy. The fossils found, though, did offer a look at the scales, follicles, and stiff bristles that covered the animals. Discovered at the bottom of a meteorite impact crater that was left about 470 million years ago, researchers found them in remarkably great condition, damming the river to safely remove the specimens. Still, after peeling them from the rocks, paleontologists were able to study this advanced, if not frightening, sea creature and get a glimpse into the ancient underwater world when sea scorpions as big as a person were the norm. Thanks for watching! Which sea creature was your favorite? Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you in the next video. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. 